Hi, I'm Chin Lu. And I'm Sal. And this is our next make. Tomorrow is our niece's birthday party, so we decided to make her this keepsake box. And we've made boxes as gifts for other family members in the past. They've had various custom covers, including hand-painted canvases. We've built out internal spaces to accommodate personal pieces, and we've also created clever locking systems to keep the things inside safe. Our niece is quite clever, so we designed this awesome customizable combination lock. She's also kind of quirky, so we decorated the box to look like a three-eyed monster. Let's jump into the build so you can see how we made it. I really love making simple boxes like this, and I enjoy adding special touches like we've done here. This box has two unique wooden pieces that make the combination lock work. The upper piece holds the locking knobs, and the lower piece slides to engage the locking pins. I focused on making these parts first. I have this extra piece of half inch white oak from our hook and ring game. It's the perfect thickness for a small box like this. To get started, I'm gonna cut it down to length at the miter saw. After cutting them to the correct size, I used the full-scale drawings I printed from SOLIDWORKS to locate all of the holes I needed to drill. I just cut the printouts to size and then temporarily held them in place using a bit of craft glue. This lets me precisely mark the centers of all the holes with an awl. On square parts like this, I also like to draw arrows on the template that remind me which way I want the grain to go. With the pieces cut to size, I can now focus on making the rabbits. I set up a sacrificial fence on the table saw so I can make the cuts. This piece has a small tab on one side that interacts with the lock. I started by cutting a rabbit along the whole side and then made shallow cuts at the bandsaw before raising the blade on the table saw to make the shoulder cuts. It's in this moment where I screwed up. That look of disappointment on my face isn't because I messed up the part. In fact, the part was fine. It's actually a look of disappointment in myself because of how I made the cut. Let's talk about that cut I just made. I thought I was being smart by taking advantage of the current setup to cut the shoulder, because it would be in the exact same location as where I left off with the rabbit. But what that ended up doing was putting the cutoff piece between the blade and the fence, and that is a recipe for kickback. What I should have done was turn the piece around, slid the fence over, and made the cut that way. Or I could have made the whole cut at the bandsaw as you see me doing here to finish up the shoulders. I tend to keep my drill press set at a speed that's appropriate for bits up to about a half of an inch in size, but when I use my larger diameter forcing bits, I do take the time to change the pulleys to slow down the RPM. You really don't want to run large bits at high speeds, both for safety reasons and to minimize wear and overheating of the bits. I used a few rasps to remove the high points left by the drill bits and turn the adjacent holes into slots. Then I rounded over the edges with an eighth inch bit and started working on the more traditional pieces of the box. I made the bottom of the box out of a scrap piece of quarter inch plywood left over from our hallway art project. And instead of taking measurements, I used the top of the box as a gauge to cut a same sized bottom. I used more of the half inch oak to make the sides of the box and started by cutting grooves in a piece that's long enough to yield all four sides. I made repeat cuts, nudging the fence over a bit until I crept up on the perfect fit for the top and bottom pieces of the box. During this process, I used a feather board to ensure the groove didn't drift, and I kept light downward pressure over the blade to make sure the groove was cut at a consistent depth. Then I cut the board into the four side pieces. I kept track of the order of the pieces so that I can have a continuous grain result in the finished box. This approach will technically only yield continuous grain on three corners, but this board has fairly straight grain, so I'm okay with the slight mismatch that may occur on the fourth corner. After cutting the pieces to length of the miter saw, I tilted the table saw blade to 45 degrees and dialed in the exact location of a stop block to remove just the right amount of material and not further shrink the length of the sides. This helps me maintain the grain match at the corners. For small boxes like this with mitered corners, I found no better way to glue things up than by using the tape method. After lining up the pieces along a straight edge, I placed one long piece along the mitered edge to prevent glue from squeezing out. Then I stretched several pieces across the joint to put it in compression when the box is closed. 
I'm gluing all six sides of the box together at once, and then after the glue dries, I'll cut the lid free. Since I won't be able to access the inside of the box and wipe up any glue squeeze out, I took the time to add painter's tape to the inside faces as well. I used an X-Acto knife to trim the tape to size. I'd normally just have the top and bottom panels float in their grooves without any glue, but because I wanted the top to stay centered in the opening, I added a small amount of glue at the midpoint of the groove on two sides. This will hold the middle of the panel in place while still allowing it to grow and shrink over time with changes in humidity. Once the glue dried, I prepared the box to have its lid cut free. I set the table saw blade just high enough to cut through the wall thickness and then ran the box through four times, taking care to keep it tight to the fence so that the cuts didn't end up misaligned. Then I prepped for the hinges, which is fairly straightforward to do, but does require a bit of finesse. After clamping the box halves together, I positioned the hinge and scored its edges. This not only gave me a visual reference for cutting, but it also severed the fibers, which helped me produce a clean final result. I always route small hinges like this freehand and slowly creep up on the score mark. If you closely watch the behavior of the wood as the router approaches the score line, it'll give you a cue to let you know that you've hit the line. You can just see the scored fibers get whisked away. Any number of finishes would be great for this project, but we've chosen to go with polycrylic for its ease of application, fast drying time between coats, and easy cleanup. With all of the wooden parts complete, we can take a closer look at the unique locking mechanism of this box. I figured out everything ahead of time using SOLIDWORKS for makers. There's one knob that slides to release the latch so the box can open, and three knobs that twist to dial in the combination. When the knob is slid forward, the tab enters an opening in the lower teeth. In this position, the lid can't open, but the knob can still slide back and forth. To prevent that from happening, you turn the knobs in the back, which causes narrow slots in the knobs to move out of alignment. Now the small pins hit the side of the knobs instead of sliding through the slots. This keeps the tab in the slotted teeth and locks the box. To make all of the locking mechanism parts, as well as all the monster themed accessories, we fired off a few small 3D print jobs. They completed fairly quickly and for the most part were easy to remove from the print bed by hand or with a simple swipe of the putty knife. I always seem to have one print though that puts up a fight. I really have to remember that when a parts design allows for it, I should add a small chamfer to the underside. This will make it much easier to get the putty knife underneath the piece. To finish up the printed parts, we sanded them a bit and used some wood putty to fill in the layer lines. This approach worked well on our elephant keychain project, but I still consider this an experiment. More traditionally, you'd use a spray-on filler primer for this step. We use acrylic paint to finish it and add a thin coat of Mod Podge to seal it up. There's tolerance added between the wood and 3D prints so that the buildup from the paint and finish will not impact the fit. For the decoration on the wooden faces, I turned to colored permanent markers to get the details of the tick marks around the dials as well as the eyelashes and tongue. I recommend getting at least one coat of finish on the wood before using a permanent marker on it so that the color doesn't bleed into the wood. This keeps the lines crisp. Be careful applying the final coat of poly on the design. If the marker is not properly dried, it may smudge. I chose to use permanent markers instead of acrylic paint on the side of the box because I want to keep the design tight and flush. Acrylic paint would definitely add texture and thickness. To attach the hinges and all of the accessories, I simply pre-drilled holes and fastened things with screws. The best part of this design is that the combination is completely customizable. I designed the knob as two pieces. The base piece has a square post on it, and the upper knob has this eight-sided star recess in it, so the base can be attached in any one of eight positions. This small notch on the back of the knob matches up with the arrow on the front, so my niece can see which way the arrow points while she decides which combination she wants.
We hope you enjoyed this episode and that it gave you some ideas for how to combine woodworking with 3D printing to create a unique gift. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on our next make.